Yeah, we could turn on the fans. Thank you, Scott. I'm sorry? That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, if anybody's wearing a toupee or a wig and it gets a little bit twisted around, they're too fast. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I should have done that years ago. <laughs> All right, we're continuing on dealing with God's plan of salvation. And uh, some of you may have heard TULIP in theology. Have you heard that phrase, TULIP? It, it's an acronym to describe, <clears throat> I guess I might call it hyper-Calvinism. Um, it's total depravity, unlimited... I just went blank. Yeah, unlimited grace, uh, uh, limited atonement, irresistible. No, it's irresistible grace and uh, the perseverance of the saints. Okay? So what, what that really is saying is <clears throat> it's saying all that we often say here is that salvation is all of God, right? But what do we also say about salvation? You have to make the choice, okay? And that's where the irresistible grace uh, kind of, some of us call ourselves four-point Calvinist. Uh, I think uh, Ron, you, and, and the search committee asked what my perspective on that was, and I told you I think I was a Calvinian. Uh, we, we know that salvation is all of God, but we proclaim the message as if it's all of us, okay? Because we don't know whom God has chosen, do we? So we proclaim Jesus to everyone, not knowing. <clears throat> That's between them and the Lord. Ultimately, if, <clears throat> which it's kind of funny, uh, in kind of a sick sort of way, those who are five-point Calvinists, those who believe that man has nothing to do with salvation, he can't help it, you're going to get saved whether you know it or not, it's going to happen. Uh, those are some of the ones who have the strongest evangelism program. Uh, and I'm going, do you understand the illogic of that? If it's totally all of God, why do you have evangelists? Okay, why do we have evangelists? Well, because Scripture teaches it uh, that that's a gift by the Holy Spirit, but it's also how will they be saved unless they hear? And how shall they hear unless someone speaks, right? Okay, so... <clears throat> that alone lets us know that we have a part in proclaiming the salvation message. Now, can you and I get anybody saved? No. What, how do they get saved? Through the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit convicts, draws them, and it's Jesus Christ who saves. Okay. Can we keep somebody from getting saved? Even though I'd like to say yes, the answer is no. You know, because sometimes I'll, I'll lay this little guilt trip, right? Well, because of you, they won't know. No, it's not. <laughs> we're we're going to be held responsible for what God's called us to do, right? But it's because of them rejecting the message. Okay? So we're going to be looking here a little bit about how God implements His plan of salvation. In Romans 16, verses 25 and 26, what does that say? Romans 16, 25 and 26. Okay, now I took those verses out of context, but by taking them out of context hasn't done any harm to them. What, what, what are we looking at in those verses? What is it saying? What 
What are some things that must take place? It has to be what? Revealed, but God has revealed it, but how has He chosen to reveal it? Okay, by the gospel, by proclaiming it, by the preaching of it. Okay, so there, God has made it known. It's not something that you just kind of walk around and hope you bump into it. Okay, it, it's something that's very intentionally made known. Okay, most of us can recall when we came to salvation through Jesus Christ, right? And, and most of us will, will realize that there was something or some event that came along that forced us to take a good, long, hard look at our lives and the, the destiny which we were headed, okay? So as you think about that, how did that happen? I'm sorry? Somebody spoke to us, but how is it they knew to speak to us about the state of our soul? They were led by God, by His Holy Spirit. There was something the other day that took place, and um, I can't even remember what it was, but I, I, I was commenting to the individual afterwards. I said, you know, I'm a firm believer that there is no such thing as coincidence or an accident. Everything is part of God's divine appointment. God. Oh, that's good. That's clever. That's good. And even in the, in the process, I shared with them, I've got my calendar with all my things, my to-do list with all my things here. But every morning I say, Lord, I'd like to get this accomplished. But help me to be sensitive to your calendar, to your schedule. Okay? And, you know, every time I'm really, re sometimes I just do it as a habit. You know, you ever have prayers like that where you just kind of go through the motions because, you know, it's the right thing to do. But it's interesting, those mornings when I'm really intentional about that and I'm, I'm serious with God, okay? Lord, I really, really, really want to know what your schedule looks like today. And I know you're not going to show me until it happens, right? And you know what? Something happens. It's because God and I were in communication. God's always in communication. It's just I'm not always listening, right? And there's a lot of things that happen in our lives that we miss God's speaking to us. Okay, so whenever you run up against someone that you have a, a sense in your spirit that I need to talk to this person, do it. And you know, the purpose of your talking to them doesn't have to be about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It can just be in talking with them. And guess what the conversation will lead to eventually? Jesus. Now, I don't know if I'm just paying attention more in life as I get a little bit older, but I'm seeing it more and more happening on a regular basis. Maybe I'm finally understanding I need to be paying attention to what's going on out there, lest I miss the opportunities. Here we see in Scripture the opportunity for us to proclaim Jesus, to preach Jesus, okay? So let's look at some of the things we need to talk about. Ephesians 2.1. Someone read that out loud, please. Ephesians 2 1. So, the book by Norman Vincent Peale, I'm Okay, You're Okay. Good book? It's a lie. It's an absolute lie. We're not okay. What does the scripture say? We're dead. We're all sinners. Dead and our transgressions and our sins, things we intended to do, things we didn't intend to do. We're dead without Jesus. Okay? So people need to understand, and I know it's not a positive thing. It's not considered correct to point out how destructive and destroyed we are, but we need to because, let's face it, I can see a beautiful body of water I can walk along the beach. Well, if my wife is holding my hand, I can. Uh, I, I get kind of, I don't get dizzy or woozy usually, 
but walking in ocean water kind of does a number on me. And so I, I'm quick to go back to the shore. But if I'm walking along the beach like that or walking in the water, what's happening? What am I, what am I experiencing? Any fear? Well, for me, maybe. But, you know, for most people, not. Right? But what if you tell me that there's really soft sand and a hollow spot underneath that sand, and I'm saying, hey, it feels solid to me. I'm good, right? I'm not fearing. I don't see the danger. And then all of a sudden, it goes out. And I can swim like a rock, not even a streamlined rock, just straight down. Now, folks, I sensed no danger, even though you warned me, right? Why would I need to be saved? Until people understand that they're going under, that they need to be rescued, there is no way out of their condition. They may think they're okay, but they're not. That's a good point. Very good point. I hadn't read that study. That's, that's very helpful. Now I need to change my preaching, I guess. I mean, <laughs> okay? So, do you understand the first part? This is part of getting the message out there. This is God's design, God's plan to present the salvation message. So, John 16, 8. John 16, 8. Again, we've, we've gone through these before at other times, but we need to remind ourselves. Okay, so the Holy Spirit convicts. He convicts. You and I can put guilt trips, right? But we really can't convict a person to want to change or to want to be changed. Yeah, I need to be careful. I don't want to say want to change because most of us want to change, but the reality is we can't on our own. We need help in being changed because what I can do if I'm a sinful fallen person, what's the best I can do? I'm sorry. But I mean, if I want to change, if I, if I want to change, you're right, that'll be the next step. But what, if I want to change, what's the best I can do if I'm a sinful fallen person? Nothing. The best I can do is not going to be good enough. So I need to be changed. And who does that? 
God via the Holy Spirit because of Jesus Christ. So we know that in order for us to know the truth, to truly understand the truth, we have to repent of our sins. What's the picture of repentance? To turn away from the direction we're going, which is a straight road towards hell. Okay? And we want to turn toward Jesus. How can we receive repentance? How can we find repentance? And who gives it? God. It's not because my parents are so nice. It's not because of my last name. It's not because of the church I go to. It's not because of what I do, what I give. It's because God grants it to them, John 1. To them, He gave the right to become children of God. Okay? Yes, sir. Right. Well, okay. Yeah, you're right. But it's God who accepts the repentance of the individual in dealing with that individual. And I should have been a little bit more thorough in that because the idea that I was going from with repentance is I, I'm no longer going the road to hell. I want to go to Christ, and I can't do that until he forgives me. Right. Exactly. But even then, without Jesus, I can't keep going in the correct direction. I need him. And that's where repentance, you've got confession, repentance, and forgiveness. They're all, you can't really separate one without the other. And, and you're right. I used one word, and I should have used all three words. Right. But we still, it's still black and white. We have responsibilities. Right. But we can't do it without his help. But our responsibility is to seek him daily, to submit and surrender to him. And I say daily, but let's just go 24 <laughs> 7. That's the reason I say that. Some people say, well, I have no responsibility. This, that's not true. No, no. And that's, that again is them taking back the control, isn't it? They're refusing to allow Jesus. To, what was the song? Break me, mold me, shape me. Spirit of the living God. Yep. There we go. Um, that's, that's what we, that should be a, a, a prayer that we sing every day to God. And some days we'd probably rather not. <laughs> I'm mad and I want to be mad. Don't bother me. But is that like Jesus? That's a rhetorical question. Okay, God causes the growth as we grow and mature. It's not because of our discipline. Even, even as a young Christian, I had the idea that if I just do all these things, I will grow. Okay, and I have to tell you, the only reason I grew is because of God's grace. But he gave me that desire and that discipline to do it. But I, I got to tell you, folks, it doesn't matter how much discipline you have, you will not grow unless you're surrendered to Christ and you allow him to do whatever work needs in your life. Because the reality is we choose what we want to grow on, right? Okay? I, I remember uh, taking some trombone lessons. I think it was my sophomore year in high school. Sophomore or junior? No, it was my junior year. Yeah, it was Joy Shambaugh was the instructor phenomenal trumpet player. She could play screech trumpet, and I thought she was so cool. Uh, she was just amazing. But she wanted to give me some trombone lessons, and, and I'm, oh, that's good. Free. Free is always good. And you know what she had me doing? For the first month, I'm sure it was a month, long tones. You know what long tones are, right? Uh, long tones, you start out soft. You find your pitch, start out soft, and you build louder and louder and louder, but the trick is to keep the pitch the same. Because, Dean, what happens if you just, just blow without adjusting yourself with the pitch? If you just blow without adjusting. Your embouchure, as you're getting, going from soft to loud. The pitch. The pitch. The pitch will change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Right. Yeah, it's the pitch will change. And, so, and she knew that because trombones are notorious for blasting. Okay? You know what? Blasting is just being as loud as you possibly can. 
She would call it obnoxious, but we just called it loud, okay? The thing of it is, she had me doing this tedious task for a long period of time. Why? So I could become better at it. So I could learn to control my pitch. So I could play the same note soft as I would loud. So I would learn control. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Yeah. Even in our, even in our, we, we, but we need to focus on the essential elements. Yeah. And in, in, our, in our walk with God, it's the same. We need to focus on those essential components. Those will help us when we get to the more needy right. things. Yeah. Um, not that we, we, won't, we, won't, we don't need to be like infants or babies that just, that just keep beating on the, the, the pablum. And do we ever have to go back to that? Yeah. yeah, sadly, we often have to go back to that because we saw a squirrel and we began to chase that squirrel. And Jesus is over here waiting for us, figuratively speaking. And then we've got to realize, why am I chasing a squirrel? It's just nutty. But up bum Anyway, so we, co- we come back. We come back and we go back to the fundamentals. What, what was David's prayer in Psalm 51? Remember the very first part of it? Restore. It's actually not the very first part. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Okay? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Sometimes I ask myself that question. Do I have the joy of my salvation? Okay? You've heard me comment that the best years of my prayer life were from 83 to 86. Now think about that. How many of you were not born yet? Yeah. Oh. You're trying to get younger, aren't you? Okay. But, you know, I, the other day I was looking back and I said, why can't I have that same joy in my prayer life that I had back then? And you know what I came up with as an answer? You? I don't get it. Oh, oh, oh. I I thought, what have you done? (laughs) Sorry, I'm a little bum. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And it's because I've allowed, catch that word, I have allowed a lot of unnecessary stuff to crowd out one of the most important aspects of my Christian walk, right? And all this stuff, some of it doesn't matter if it gets done or not. Some of it doesn't need to be done. What needs to be done is my deepening and developing of my relationship with Christ. And what happens to me? I begin to grow and mature in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're saying, what's that got to do with salvation? Everything. Because when I find myself falling in love with Jesus more and more, you know what I want to do? I want to tell other people about Jesus. I want them to experience what I've experienced. I want them to understand what it means to know that life may look like it's crashing down all around you, but you are in the hands of Jesus. You are under his authority and under his control, and he is your brother, your friend, and he's promised you a place in heaven. Everything else doesn't really mean a whole lot. Okay? All right, God finishes his plan up, and that we're talking into that whole thing, Romans 8, 29, that we be conformed into the image of his Son. Okay. So conversion. 
Um, I'm going to just read something MacArthur has here. Numbers 21, verses 5 through 9, records how the children of Israel sinned against God, and so God sent deadly snakes that bit them and caused death. The people realized their sin and asked to be delivered. God instructed Moses to put a fiery bronze serpent on a pole, and when someone was bit, they could look on it and be saved. In a way, that illustrates conversion. However, instead of a serpent on a pole, we have the Son of God on a cross. So, conviction of sin, look at Romans 3.20. Because some people will say, well, what's sin for you may not be sin for me. Well, not according to God's Word on most things. I say most things because some people make sin to be sin that's not really sin, but it becomes sin to them because they've allowed it to be that. So if you think something is sin and yet you participate in it, that's a no-no. But if you don't think something is sin because God's Word doesn't say it's sin, then Paul says we have freedom. Okay? Some people would say these chairs are sinful. Well, chairs are immoral. They're chairs for crying out loud. But there are some people that would say, you have soft, com you shouldn't be comfortable in church. I see drugs up there. <laughs> well, David used simples. And many other things. Yeah, that's been an issue too. Yeah. So, Romans 3.20, what does it say? Ah, through the law comes the knowledge or consciousness of sin. That's, by the way, the purpose of the law. Galatians tells us it's a schoolmaster or a tutor. The law was never designed to save. It was designed to point out our need to be saved because we can't keep the law. So that's going to reveal people's sinfulness. Just because you and I say something sinful... That doesn't mean anything to most people, does it? Well, that's your opinion. Okay. That's why the Bible says is your best tool in your kit, right? The Bible says. Um, yesterday I was blessed to be part of a, a funeral service and a committal service of a young woman over in Heartland. And uh, I had a couple people come up to me afterwards and make a comment about how they were just amazed by the message. And I'm going, hmm... They must not go to church. And, uh, but then they said, no, we, we've, we've heard this stuff before, but we heard it differently. And I said, well, the reality, ma'am, is this is God's Word. It's not just words I come up with. This is God's Word. Oh. And they were puzzled. So you can tell your dad, and you should know also, I gave her a card and I said, here, on this card, you can see our church video, worship video, every Sunday. And they said, wow, I'm going to do that. Because right now they don't go to church. But folks, when you use the Word of God and not your personal opinion, that's when the Holy Spirit has authority and power, right? Because He will take His Word and apply it to hearts. And that's why I'm... I, I used to feel very lazy. You know, I'm just... For example, at a committal service, I only have three sentences that are not God's Word out of the whole committal service. Everything else is just Scripture. It's just Scripture. I might introduce it or something like that, but it's just Scripture. And at the beginning, I felt lazy. What am I doing? Just, I mean, this is, I should say something, right? Who provides the greatest comfort? God does. What has the most authority and the most power? God and His Word. Okay. That, that's why it's so terribly important that you and I be in the Scriptures on a regular basis. That we read it, that we study it, and that we talk to the author of the Scriptures on a regular basis. Now, whatever regular is, I'm not going to give you a formula. Sometimes it's just all the time. Sometimes it's a specific, here's my prayer closet time. I'm out, I'm gone, you can't talk to me, God and I are doing business now. Whatever works for you, but you need to do something. Because God will put people in your path 
which I just love how he does that. You're not from around here, are you? What are you doing up here from Kansas? I love how God opens doors. And, you know, I've been seeing that as this is not an opportunity to explain why I'm here from Kansas from a practical level. This is my opportunity to explain why I'm here because God brought me here. And God has something amazing to tell you. And I'd like to share that with you. Okay? You guys can have your own story to tell. You have a testimony. Whatever that might be, you have a testimony. Now, we know that when the people did realize that they made a horrible mistake as Peter preaches his great Pentecost message, do you remember what it says there uh, in Acts 2, 36, I believe it is, 2, 36, 37? You don't have to read the whole thing out loud, but just tell me what, what happened to the people when they realized, man, we blew it. <clears throat> they were pierced to the heart. They were pierced to the heart. And then they said, what must we do to be saved? Isn't that amazing? And all Peter did was share what happened. He quoted from the Old Testament multiple times in his sermon. Actually, he did point the finger. He said, you crucified him. And see, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have got it without all those other scriptures. But he also put the application in there. This is what this passage means. Made it very personal, absolutely. Now, you remember some weeks ago I preached in Luke about the, the Pharisee and the tax collector? And the Pharisees, <laughs> you almost hear the hrumph, hrumph, you know, I'm such a great guy. Uh, you know, boy, I'm glad I'm not like everybody else. In fact, that old tax collector over there, scum of the earth, I'm glad I'm not like him. In fact, here's all the great things I do, God. Just let me tell you. I want you to be aware of what all I do for you, God. He just almost, he reminds you of some cartoon character, doesn't he? And then you got the tax collector. And what does he say? Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me. And actually in the Greek, it's the sinner. That's where the English really messed it up. Because it doesn't make sense in our thinking, right? But in that culture, it was understood that when you say that, it's like what Paul said, I'm the worst of the worst. You know, the Marines say the best of the best. Paul would say, I'm the worst of the worst. This tax collector, I'm the sinner. I, you want to play sinner king of the hill? I've got it. I am scum. What, what did he just recognize? He's a sinner. He needs help. He needs saved. He needs mercy. Yeah. Second Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. Again, another... You know, I, I say an important passage. They're all important passages. Please don't think that I'm saying one's more important than another. But in this context, it's, it's a very powerful passage. Chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> oh, where'd it go? Someone read that, please. Yet now I am happy, not because you are made sorry, but because your sorrow led me to repentance. For you had come to me so that you could be saved, and you were Yeah, I, I saw something. I've seen it several times, but I saw it again the other day. I was going to Bangor to visit someone in the hospital, and there was a policeman that was behind a car that was stopped. And, of course, the policeman usually stays around as the car pulls out, and this is happening about 
three-fourths of a mile ahead of me, so I'm, I'm seeing that the lights are still on, and I pull into the left lane, as the law requires, and uh, all of a sudden, this car peels out and goes down the highway, and I, I'm just kind of waiting for the policeman to pull out and go after him again, and he didn't. But it's kind of like, did you not learn anything? In fact, I think I probably said that out loud. <laughs> so for those of you who have ridden with me, you know I say those things. Uh, that wasn't genuine sorrow, was it? If he was sorrowful at all, it's because he got caught doing something. Or he's trying to get away with something. I don't know. But genuine sorrow would mean he probably would want to pull out gradually and be very obedient to the laws. You would think so, right? For a person to say, I'm sorry, and confess their sin, repent, quote-unquote, seek forgiveness, etc., and then to go back doing what they're doing, what does that say? Yeah, they're probably not sorrowful. They're, they're probably not sorrowful. Paul says here that godly sorrow produces repentance, a genuine desire to change. And in verse 10 it says that repentance leads to salvation. Okay? Now, I've actually heard some people say, well, they, they said they've repented, they've, they've said they're sorry, they've asked for forgiveness, but they haven't done enough to prove it. So therefore, they aren't really repentant. Is there anything wrong with that? Yeah, you don't have to do anything. And to be quite frank, you don't have to prove anything to anybody else especially when everyone else around you sees your life has changed. But because whatever you did earlier was such a heinous thing, they want to hold it over the head saying, it's not good enough. You've got to do this and this and this and this and this. Then I might believe you. And if you do this, 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 I'm probably going to add some more stuff to it. Okay? And you might be saying, you mean that type of behavior is still going on in our world today? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Absolutely. No. And who am I wanting to be reconciled first and foremost with? Christ. With Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And true yeah. And it will be seen by what you do, obviously. But it's not based upon somebody else's criteria of what you do. It's based upon God's Word right? Please understand that. Sounds like those people might also be the kind of people that are always looking for signs to prove God's existence or His work or His... If we, and we, and even Christians could fall into that. Oh, yes. Looking for signs from God you know, as evidence, as proof. As, you know, yep. And then, and then within us, they were always they were proving it, they were showing it. Right. And it has to be signs that I can understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Well, you look at Peter and Judas. Both of them did horrible things, right? They denied the Savior. Both of them denied the Savior. One just got a profit from it. Okay? Peter, when he was sorrowful, was it genuine? Yeah, it was genuine repentance. Judas realized, oh, I did a person wrong. He, he's getting the short end of the stick. This isn't right. I feel terrible. I'm going to have to live with this the rest of my life. Now, the Scripture doesn't say all those things, but you can kind of read into that. We can look at sorrow perhaps as, as going inward as opposed to repentance, which is going upward. Yeah. And if you allow it to go inward with the Holy Spirit's application, you can then experience the outward Yep. 
And I think that's the key, it's self, as opposed to my relationship with God. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Now we can get into some theology there, can't we? Well, we won't. Because he was called the son of perdition as well, but that's based upon God's foreknowledge. But the legal reality is he certainly could have experienced it. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So the first, the, after the first time, was he truly remorseful or was repentant? If he was, would he have done it the next time? Yeah, I don't the think. Next time, or yeah, was I. That Yeah, he didn't understand until when the rooster crowed, and then it says, then he realized, okay. But you bring up a very interesting question that you probably didn't mean to, but I'm glad you brought it out that way. Exactly. See, she meant to. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. sometimes it truly is because we just don't realize that we're not in the right, and other times it's, we do realize that, but then, oops, we just took a detour. And yeah. I, I, I actually had an analogy at one point. You talked about getting on the road, you know, getting on the path to Christ. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we, even when we are on that road, there are detours. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and those detours are our own fault. It's obstacles we put in the way on that road. So we're forced to go off to a side road. But the cool thing, and I don't know why I'm just analogy driven today, but I feel like. Mm -hmm. But it's always going to, if we were truly saved, it's always going to bring us back to that, there you go. to that road. To, to, but sometimes those detours, we don't even realize it's, that we've taken a detour. Mm -hmm. It's kind of veered a little bit. But other times, we know darn well we've done it. Oh, yeah. That's the sin yeah. versus so, the trespass. So far, yeah. I think we do in a way because we have that pang of guilt within us, which is the Holy Spirit, right? Um, I, I like how we've got the whole issue of sanctification. It's, it's a two-sided coin, remember? Uh, the one side is when you and I say yes to Jesus Christ, we are saved. We're set apart. We're children of God, John 1 tells us. The other side of sanctification is that continuing, growing process that won't be complete until we see Jesus face to face. Now, the reality, a Christian is indeed, salvation is not a work in progress, but our Christian life is a work in progress. It, it's not... Working out the salvation. Yeah. Yeah, and that working out your salvation is not trying to get saved again and work keeping all the things together, but showing what it means to be a follower of Christ, okay? Peter, yeah, he, he probably understood a little bit because to lie like that, uh, but it thought, it's kind of like, well, I just did it for safety. God understands. God knows my, well, no. It's like I tell my children, a white lie is still a lie. You just got an adjective in front of it. That's, that's, it's just a lie. Um, but then Peter acts too. Wow. Mr. Mouth used it for the glory of God. Then you go to Galatians 2. Paul says, Peter was clearly in the wrong, so I opposed him to his face. Because Peter had taken that detour and thought, hey, it's just a whole lot simpler to get along with these Judaizers because they're just making life miserable. I'm sure God understands these Galatians, you know, they're Gentiles, and, and I shouldn't really be around. I'm trying to keep my witness doors open, to, you know, everything like that. And Paul is just, justifying. yeah, justifying, absolutely. And, and yet you look at First Peter and Second Peter going, wow, he gets it. He understands. He really understands. Folks, that's our life, isn't it? Some of us might be like the Apostle John. Some of us might be like the Apostle Peter. I really want to be like Jesus. You know, Apostle John seemed to really get it, but he also was known as what? A son of thunder. He had a violent temper. 
And my mother would say, yeah, you're probably like Peter and John. Oh, that wasn't a very nice thing to say, Mom. <laughs> but that's, that's where we are, right? So we, we do sin. We do continue to struggle with this. Not because we want to, but because we squirrel. Don't you love the squirrel moments? I wonder what this does. I could do this or that or whatever. And Jesus is saying, I'm still over here. Yeah, which if you were in Jesus' mind, I mean, we have the mind of Christ, but think about this. The illogic of us. Yes. Yeah. And that's what Satan does, is he blinds their eyes. And, and, you know, we talk about how evil and horrible and corrupt our nation is and stuff like that. Folks, you look at some of the history back in Christ's time and the first two centuries afterwards, we're kind of in Disney World right now. I, I mean, I'm not trying to say this is all, it's not okay. But compared to what the early church experienced and the horrible persecution that they experienced, and the evil that was being done. You know, we talk about the openness of uh, blatant homosexuality here. No, you look back at the first century. It was, even before Christ came, some of the most horrific, corrupt. Look at what Israel did as they bought into the, the worship of the different gods around them and some of the worship practices that took place with temple prostitutes, sacrificing their own children, eating their own families. Yeah. May grace increase. Right. Instead of growing angry and right. hateful and, you know, right. and sinners, you know, and all that sort of thing. No. That, that just feeds and plays into the enemy's And that's a key, key point. You know, you know who I get angry at? People who claim the name of Jesus and teach contradiction to Scripture. Misleading people. Those who are practicing sin are doing so because they're blind and ignorant. You and I were practicing sin, weren't we? Exactly. Yep. No. Right. Right. But once we're in Christ, that has been forgiven, and we don't have a want to to keep on sinning. And that's, the and that's the key. That's the key. If you want to express anger, talk to God about it, first of all. But when there are pastors and preachers and theological seminaries and stuff like that teaching falsehoods, trying to be acceptable into our society, that's when you get angry. Not at the people. That's, you know, people have for years made the comment or the idea that, Pastor, you hate Roman Catholics. Not at all. I do not hate Roman Catholics. Well, you hate Mormons. Not at all. I don't hate Mormons. Well, you hate Jehovah Witnesses. I don't hate Jehovah Witnesses. You get it? following a pattern here? But what do I hate? The doctrine. The doctrines that are of the devil that contradict Scripture. In fact, you could say, I hate Baptists. With that same logic, right? I don't hate Baptists. I'm an Anabaptist. Okay? What I do hate is any focus upon teaching wrong biblical doctrine. 
You can only be saved by the King James Version. Well, you know what? doesn't matter what translation you use. You can't be saved by any versions. You're saved by only Jesus Christ. Okay. What she's saying is I can get mad all I want if I'm doing it right. No. <laughs> righteous indignation leads to righteousness. That's a, good, that's a good bumper sticker. I don't use bumper stickers, but that'd be close. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and who was Jesus angry with? Was it the sinners? The Pharisees. The self-righteous. Yeah. So, wow. We're going to turn to Christ next week. <laughs> that's... Help me to remember that. We, if you notice, we did review a little bit because last week we kind of went whew, through some of it. So I want to go back and review, and then we went ahead a little bit, and now we're going to be coming up to turning to Christ. So please remind me, we don't need to repeat anything else. Okay, keep us going. Questions or comments? Sorry? Oh, it's my privilege. There it is.